Hey guys, it's Gary. I'm back, uh, obviously. Um, <clears throat> once again, uh, I did this a couple of videos ago, if not my last one. Um, can't sleep. It's about 3 o'clock in the morning, and I've been trying. Um, and I'm a little sick of laying there trying to get to sleep and not doing it. I don't know why I can sleep fine during the day, which is just really bad. Um, so it's Sunday night. Three, about three in the morning. <coughs> Got tired of laying there, started reading emails, and um, then thought, ah, it's been a couple days since I did a video. So, um, I do have music playing in the background. I can't crank it up too much because of the hour. Yeah, I do live in a condo. I'll put it up a little bit louder. Um, I don't know if any of it's going to come out. <sighs> what I thought I would do is, um, you know, I've got ideas for videos, and uh, it just dawned on me, though, that I have no idea how to keep track of what I showed in the past, unless I was going to sit there and re-watch all of my old videos. So I haven't come up with a method, and I don't know if anybody has any suggestions, um, especially when I show things that aren't related. Uh, I know I did an Oregon video on the band Oregon and the solo projects. That's easy to keep track of, because that was the whole video. In this case, I'm going in the almost opposite direction, something that uh, Carm and Daryl Washington and a whole bunch of others have, have done. And actually, it's a fairly standard thing. Um, and that is to show either what you've been listening to lately, or um, I have things I call one-offs. And um, those would be primarily artists that I only have one, maybe two CDs by. So I'm not an expert, uh, obviously nobody that I could do a whole video on because I only have one or two CDs um, for whatever reason. So, um, and oddly enough, um, I, I'm, I guess I get like OCD a bit about artists because I tend to pick up on an artist and then buy everything that they do, um, like, a, like an Eberhard Weber or a Ralph Towner or somebody like that, instead of doing what most people would do, and that's like buy maybe half of the Ralph Towner or Eberhard Weber catalog, and then pick things here and there. I just go nuts on artists, and I like buy everything that they've ever done. <clears throat> and yet, you know, obviously I'm going to end up with uh, in artists that I have, you know, one or two CDs by, and I'm even ones that I like, um, for whatever reason. Um... I will show, I guess I'm going to start with the only guy here that I actually have two CDs by. Um, and that is a guy, Yoshio Suzuki. Yoshio Chin Suzuki is his name, morning picture. This is the particular album of his that is a must-have. It's playing in the background. I don't know to what extent you can hear it. Been out of print for many years, uh, betting used copies probably float around still. Short-lived JVC label, uh, the JVC record label, started by the JVC company, I guess originally in Japan, but they you know, opened it up to America too. Uh, I guess the, the JVC um, Stereo Manufacturing Electronic Equipment Company apparently was doing really well and they um, Broadened their horizons in in terms of uh, I think I think they went into a couple of different things, all kind kind of music related, um, you know besides stereo equipment, and in the late well, late actually in the mid eighties I didn't realize this is from eighty four, um, they started a record label, and looking at the output of the record label was mostly artists I had never heard of. And then it dawned on me that they were Japanese artists, and it dawned on me that, oh, they probably started the record label in Japan to distribute Japanese artists primarily, and um, then decided to open it up and, you know, release the records over here uh, in America as well. Because they had Japanese artists that I had never heard of before, and even Japanese bands that I had never heard of before, and I actually have seen little of since. Um, I can only think of one American group that I recall seeing, and that was um, the New York-based smooth jazz band uh, Special Effects actually had a contract with JVC for a while, and they recorded um, 
a few albums, two or three albums for them, and solo albums from the two primary members of Special Effects. But those were the only American ones that I recall. Um, I could be wrong. I think they had another smooth jazz saxophone player, actually. Now that I think about it, there was a <coughs> excuse me, saxophone player named Mark Johnson that played with Special Effects. And uh, he had he had solo album release. He's Amer another American guy. Um, but those were the most commercial ones. The those smooth jazz things were the most commercial ones. Um, most of the Japanese artists were of the stuff that I've heard. Uh, jazz based, but 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 um, I don't want to say smooth jazz, but but like almost new age smooth, new age jazz. You know the jazz element, but but not acoustic. Not not acoustic oriented, hard blowing, improvisation jazz. Um, and this one, I don't know why I picked it up. Besides, I love the cover. Um, and I only have, you know, there's some of those JVCs that that um, there's a couple bands that looked interesting that I wanted to pick up, and then you know the record label did not last long. I want to say two, three years maybe. And unfortunately, everything I've seen that they released by the Japanese artists never came back out, was never reissued, uh, at least in America. And maybe they were purchased by another record company and re-released in Japan, where the artists may have been better known. Um, but this particular gentleman, Yoshio Suzuki, who spent a lot of years in New York, oddly enough, but who I believe has, after living here for maybe a couple of decades, actually moved back to Japan last I heard. Um, I don't know. He's fairly young when he made this. Um, not sure. I don't know. It may not be his first album. But it's interesting because I tend to forget when listening to the album. It's all keyboard oriented. Um, piano and synthesizers and upright bass, all played by uh, Suzuki. Um, and when you listen to this, you tend to forget that Suzuki was primarily known as a bass player, not a keyboard player. He's a pretty damn good keyboard player, too. Um, pretty stuff, uh, new agey. There's the thing that I really dig about this album, and it doesn't give it away in the back of it so much, so it was quite a find for me because I love solo albums, is that um, with the exception of the first <coughs> two tracks where there's a, a small band, there's um, a drummer, some saxophone, some guitar. Uh, the first two tracks, which are very mellow, pretty jazz, that always remind me of um, the first Pat Metheny group album, very much in that mode of the, of the quieter stuff on the first uh, Pat Metheny group album from 1977, or just a quartet uh, with Lyle Mays and Mark Egan on bass and Danny Gottlieb on drums. First two tracks sound like they, you know, the, the two tracks with the band sound like very much from that era. This is from a 84, it's got an 84 date on it, so, you know, I don't know when it was recorded, 83, 84. Um, first two tracks, very pretty. Um, there's a little bit of, uh, you know, drums on there, but it's not rhythmic. It's There's nothing up tempo on here, actually. Um, all of the tracks, all of them, were written by Suzuki, and um, there's ten tracks. The first two are kind of band things, um, but the other eight are all Suzuki solo. And there's nothing on here that tells you that. So, and I love I love those solo discs. You know, he plays multiple overdubbed keyboards and upright bass, no electric bass. Um, and so you got the first two things that sound a little bit like very mellow Pat Metheny group, very early, very mellow Pat Metheny group. And um, then you've got the rest are keyboard oriented. Um, a lot of electric keyboards, but there's also acoustic piano in there. There's a little little bit of dr drum machine on there uh, on like one or two tracks. Mostly short, mostly shorter tracks on under five minutes. Um, but it, it's a really great album. Um, and this is one that I bought this as a, you know, pretty much a new release. So I would have bought this 84, 85, 86, somewhere in there. Um, you know, uh, JVC was still going as a label back then. Um, I don't know what made me pick it out. I really don't. Uh, the JVC all had nice, really nice album covers. And I still look for them. <clears throat> but every once in a while I go on, a, <coughs> I'll go on Amazon 
and look at some of those old albums that you know, by these obscure Japanese artists that I don't know. This doesn't look like it got reissued, but I do recall seeing, I don't know, I can't recall last time I looked, uh, quite a few used copies around, and this is before I even knew about Discogs, so I bet you it's probably more in Discogs. Um, very mellow, very mellow. Um, no, nothing too abstract. Um, maybe slightly, there might be one or two pieces that are a little bit not pretty, but, but nothing out there. Very low key. Um, and yet, this is one of those albums where everything just works and comes together for me. I think Carm would really like this album, um, as one person who would like it. Some people might see it as too mellow, too laid back. Um, and I, I, I certainly liked it enough to go out and seek out other things by Suzuki, who's got... Um, there are a bunch of other um, Yoshio Suzuki albums out there. Um, some of them he did uh, under a group name, which makes it really... I, I, I don't like when musicians do that. Um, he formed this group called East Bounce, and it just dawned on me that it was under, under East Bounce's name and not Suzuki's name. Um, but it's really Suzuki's band. It's his... Yeah, and I don't know, um, I, I'm sure they made more than this one CD. This is from um, 95, so it's 11 years after uh, the more. Oh, by the way, Morning Picture is the name of this. Highly, highly recommend it. Um, sorry the JVC label didn't last. This East Bounce is from 95. Um, it, it's good, but it's just a... Essentially, it's a contemporary... Jazz thing, nothing avant-garde. Uh, there's definitely more up-tempo stuff on here um, than, than than on the morning picture album. But you know, you if I played these two side by side, you probably wouldn't even think it was the same artist necessarily, because um, morning picture is definitely delicate. And this is more of a, a jazz thing. This, the, the rhythm section is there, um, and all the compositions are by Suzuki actually. Um, and maybe one or two are co-written. But interestingly, on this uh, album and this kind of band, I, you know, I guess it's a band. I see a lot of guests listed here. <coughs> uh, Suzuki's acting primarily as a bass player, as the bassist of the band, even though he wrote all the compositions. Uh, he only plays keyboards on two tracks. He plays bass on all of the tracks, upright bass, um, except for one of the ones where he plays keyboards on. Um, so he's got another keyboard player in the group. So right there, um, the keyboard player is, you know, well, he's got, this is why I don't, it's not really a band. He's got two different keyboard players that, that kind of, on some tracks they play together. Uh, they alternate tracks. They have one guy's an acoustic um, pianist, only plays acoustic piano. And the second keyboard player plays acoustic and electric pianos and synthesizers. So right there, obviously, it's going to have a different flavor because the Morning Picture album is Suzuki himself on his keyboards, you know, playing all the keyboard parts. Um, these other two guys that he's got playing, they both appear to be Japanese. Nothing wrong with them, but, um, you know, with, with the keyboards being the probably the primary instrument up front, um, obviously, they're not played by Suzuki, so it's not going to sound like Morning Picture. Um, it's, I, you know, if I would have bought it on its own, I, I, I like it, you know, but but it has almost nothing to do with Morning Picture. And I want to say East Bounce made probably a, two or three recordings, maybe more. Um, but I don't actually know who's in the group because you've got these two keyboard players, um, you've got a drummer. But then you've got guests. You've got Steve Gadd playing drums, which is kind of weird, on two tracks, even though all the other tracks have the same other guy, this guy, uh, Cecil Monroe, playing drums. So I don't actually know who's in the band. Ralph, Mac Ralph McDonald is a famous, famous, famous session percussionist, played with George Benson for years, plays percussion on here. Dave Liebman does a saxophone thing on one track, so I guess this must have been recorded in America, this one. These are all American musicians, except for the actual band members, it seems. Um, he's got a, a Japanese saxophone player that plays on uh, almost all of the tracks. Looks like he, he might not be on one track. So it seems like there's, there's basically three Japanese musicians. Two of them are keyboard players. One of them's a saxophone player, and it looks like those may be actually the band members. 
Um, but it's not, I'm, I'm not sure because it's not a, you know, instead of saying here's who's in the band and here's who's a guest on the album, all I have is a listing of the musicians. I could be wrong, but yeah, see, they just... Yeah, I don't actually know who the who the group is, or is Eastbound say uh, some kind of concept of Suzuki's? But if it's it's still a Suzuki solo album, as far as I'm concerned, but just with all you know, he's basically only playing bass on it, um, keyboards on two tracks. Uh, he's got Marcus Miller playing bass on one track, which will tell you, you know, not that I don't like Marcus Miller, but there's a you know, he's a very heavy kind of funky rhythm player. Um, so it goes to show you that there's more of a groove in these tracks um, that I think he's going for. There's more of a solid bottom to him, you know, a, a drum beat, you know, a, a, a standard drum beat in a, you know, kind of oriented music, even though Suzuki is playing bass on most of them, on all but one track. All but two tracks, actually. Um, but uh, it, it's more it's more drum and maybe groove oriented. Um, still not a bad album, but uh, I think if you're a fan of the the softer, maybe nor, new agey keyboard, you know, piano and synth oriented stuff, that you'd be disappointed after here. You know, if you heard East Bounce after you heard this, and I'm. And I and I think in recent years I see that he's done a he's done a trio thing too, if I'm not mistaken. He's got a, a set trio band, unlike East Bounce, which is just a ton of musicians. Um, I want to say because I, I seem to recall seeing uh, albums with a just a bass player and a drummer and uh, Suzuki, and I'm not even sure Suzuki's playing keyboards or whether he's the bass player. I can't recall now. Um, but I, I want to find things that are like this by him. I don't know how, you know, because I think I think I think this was something of a, maybe an anomaly in his in his recorded works. <coughs> okay, so that's all I have two by him so far. Um, here's one I've been playing again recently. I pull out it's, it's a movie soundtrack um, by a guy Colin Towns, who you probably wouldn't know. You look up his name, you will see a bunch of jazz releases where he leads a big band. Um, interesting. Um, this is the only album by him I have, and it is a movie soundtrack for a movie. In England, it was called um, Full Circle. In America, it's called The Haunting of Julia. Um, the album is called... Uh, full circle after the British title as a British musician keyboard player <coughs> I believe he plays keyboards and flute and um, I didn't realize I knew who he was I happened to be watching a television broadcast of uh, The Haunting of Julia which is the American title of the movie and it, the movie came out in 78 1978 and I dug the movie soundtrack um, which is primarily keyboards um I know, I know Towns plays flute. Uh, there might be a little bit of flute in there. Um, but the soundtrack is limited to um, pretty much just Towns playing various keyboards and f a bit of flute. And a guy, Mark Nausif, who I'm also aware of, who plays some percussion. Uh, or he's listed as additional percussion. There's not very much percussion on the on the soundtrack. But I was watching this movie. Very, very moody, good well done ghost story um, which stars what the hell is her name I can't believe I forgot it now Pharaoh, <coughs> uh, what's her name Lisa holy shit I can't believe I forgot her name um, Mia Farrow sorry for the brain fart Mia Farrow, Keir DeLay, Tom Conti. Um, so there was people that you know in, in, in the movie, you may know. Um, and uh, I heard the soundtrack, was watching the movie. My cover's broken. Um, and I heard one of my favorite sounds in the world, and that is 70s synthesizers. There's a piano theme that is repeated through the, through the movie. 
Um, but there's this, but the lead line is played on, I, I think it's a monophonic synthesizer. Um, and it's got a very cool monophonic sound to it, that very 70s-ish, but in, in a good way. And I said, oh, i got to have that soundtrack. And I looked at who the composer was, and the name looked a little bit familiar. And it turns out he was um, a very formally, I believe, trained school musician. But he actually played uh, as the keyboard player in the 70s and maybe even early 80s for Deep Purple vocalist Ian Gillen's band that he was a member of. My computer's doing its funky things again. Um, so oh, my. My voice may be slowed down and all that because I can I can see my computer freaking out. That's what happens. I keep running out of space and I keep on having to delete things. Um, and so I had heard of him playing with Ian Gillen's band, um, but um, that really has no bearing on this. But it's just like gee, I knew that name from somewhere. Um, and uh, this is a fantastic soundtrack, and they did the right thing. They, they uh, so it's all him solo, a little bit of percussion from Mark Nosif on the on this, and just a man. If you love that synthesizer sound from the '70s, it's just it's so in there. Um, and you know, this movie was actually broadcast recently here in the I don't know if it was one of the New York stations or not. A uh, basic cable station showed it within the last few months, and I watched it again. Um, I've seen the movie probably two times and now I watched it a third time just to hear how the soundtrack was integrated, how the music was uh, integrated into the movie because I got so familiar with listening to it from here. I forget how long the soundtrack is. It's maybe 30, maybe 40 minutes. What they did though, instead of just releasing the soundtrack, this is a really good label. I, was, I know this is out of print, sadly, sadly, and I bought it just at the right time. Um, and even though it was, it was recorded either probably around 77. He actually did demos for the music on the album before the movie was made in 1976. The movie came out in 78, but there's no, no information on when the music was actually recorded. Um, I'm sure they didn't use the demos. So, probably 77 is my guess. This Koch, Koch Screen is the label. Um, and they probably do mainly movie soundtracks because their name looks familiar to me. Um, this only came out in 95, um, and I get a feeling, I don't believe it, it ever came out on LP even. Um, so I believe it's 1995, which was almost, you know, 20 years after the movie, um, it came out. And because the soundtrack isn't incredibly long, maybe it's, maybe it's 35, 40 minutes, they actually included some really um, incredible writing um, compositions that have nothing to do with the movie. They just kind of pad out the CD with this by Colin Towns writing, uh, it's a trumpet concerto for string orchestra, a fairly large scale piece that Colin Towns wrote. And another piece called 1930 C Cityscape um, that features baritone sax as the main instrument. So a lot of orchestral stuff on here as well. It has nothing to do with the movie soundtrack. It was written apparently many years later. They just included it because they had space on the CD and it's because it's a Colin Towns, you know, production as well and composition. And it's really nice because, you know, I would have bought it even without the additional stuff. And it's an entirely different context. Unfortunately, you don't get to hear Towns playing, um, you know, synthesizers and those orchestral pieces. But if you ever... If you ever get to see the movie Full Circle, uh, The Haunting of Julia with Mia Farrow, um, you might want to tune in just to hear the soundtrack. I know this is get going for, I just, I lucked across this, I must have, that TV broadcast must have just come just about at the point in 95 when the CD was released, because it was very easily obtainable and appeared to go out of print right away. The only thing by Towns I have, um, as a solo artist. I looked into more stuff of his, but it's all big band stuff, it seems. You know, he likes um, you know, to write for big bands, and I would love to find some solo keyboard things by him. Um, now, I got um, something that I just listened to tonight after you know, not, not really having the, the finances to go out and buy new CDs. I'm going into my own back catalog here. And some of you may know that the flute player, Tim Weeder, um, I only have one CD by him. I have no recollection of, I, I know I've had it for years, 
Um, it's got a 1988 date on it. I didn't probably buy it in 88, but this this was probably a store bought thing, which means you know pre internet. Um, I saw it; it looked interesting. Flute player, he plays all the instruments on here. It's you know multiple flute parts, um, and. You know what? Uh, there's also some nature sounds in there, bird calls and stuff like that, which I'm generally not a fan of. I might be the only guy in the world that doesn't find the bird calls restful when I'm listening to it to a piece, and sometimes actually distracting. Um, and maybe that's because I listen so closely that I actually listen to what the birds are doing instead of kind of letting it uh, fade into the background. But it really doesn't hurt. It, it, it's at the beginning of, of one of the two pieces on the album. Interesting though, the album is only two pieces. They're both 24 minutes long, and it's all multiple overdub flutes and everything. Um, I really recommend this album. Like I said, it's from 88. He's a British musician, I guess. It, it appears that this was made in England, recorded in England. Um, and I I dig it, but I just went and looked. He's got a lot of he's got a lot of albums and. Somewhere, maybe it was just from the samples. I thought I heard or had another album by him, but I don't think I do. Um, but most of the other albums I see have all short five-minute tracks on them. There's other musicians involved, and in some case drummers, and that's going to be a whole completely different ball field. This may be a bad time to be looking for this album or just about any Tim Tim, Tim Weeder album. I went on Amazon to do a, to, to look. I wanted to see if I could find something similar to this and I only found one other album that has like a couple really long tracks on it that might be in this mode uh, there's no drums in here no no percussion no no additional uh, musicians just just Tim Weeder and I like it and I think a lot of people who would watch my videos would like it um, and there's a lot of he does a lot of other things with um, band members it seems you know and short five-minute songs and that kind of thing it's 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 a different world um than this i did find one album of his that had longer pieces on a couple longer pieces like this one unfortunately this is a bad time to be a tim weeder fan because it seems like um much or most of his stuff is out of print at least over here in america and even that one cd that i saw that has longer pieces on it was you know like a hundred dollars for a new copy or something like that you know so I kind of time I may have timed this video wrong it seems like almost everything he's done is out of print and I don't know if it was on multiple label it's just bad timing here in the US anyway um, being that he's a British musician he's, he's I'm sure on a different label over in England and Europe and maybe his stuff is in print maybe this album is in print over there I don't know but um, just about everything I saw was currently out of print, you know, and he's got um, over a dozen albums. And everything, it seems, in America is out of print. And, you know, you could maybe find some used copies for cheaper. Uh, but it's it's kind of it's kind of distressing. And I just put this on, and believe it or not, this wasn't loaded into my computer, which means I haven't listened to it in years. I loaded my computer, and I gave it a listen. Really good stuff. Really liked it. Another one that I didn't have loaded in my computer... Um, that I loaded in and I actually listened to two or three times is on the Venture. I don't know if anybody remembers Venture. Venture was one of those labels that came along in the mid-70s. Now, it was distributed by Virgin Records, which is huge. And I'm not clear. I could never figure. I've got at least two CDs on this label that I know of, if not three. And it's another label like the whole JVC thing that was around for like two years and they just got out of the business and what they did was all instrumental uh, music. I thought initially it was more of an electronic thing and maybe it was because um, the other one I have is all uh, electric keyboard oriented um, but that's only two CDs so and, and this one is almost all acoustic. Um, but the Venture label, I can't, I can never figure out whether it was a separate little independent label that managed to get distribution by Virgin or whether Virgin themselves created this uh, subsidiary label to distribute kind of n new instrumental music or new age music because this was pretty much at the time that new age music was just really starting to hit the you know hit, hit the world mid 80s and um, I only saw a few things on venture I saw them disappear very very quickly and I had forgotten 
what was on this album? Um, Eduardo Nibla and Antonio Forraconi, Celebration. Um, not that you can read the liner notes, but there's almost nothing in there. There's the name of the tracks, um, and they don't list what instruments the musicians play. Well, when you put it on, you can hear for yourself. Basically, they're, they're, and I didn't know when I bought it, it was a blind buy. I didn't hear it anywhere, and they don't even list the instrumentation on here. Um, and it's an album that was recorded in September 1987, and it came out right afterwards on Venture Records, based in London. So, I don't know, I tend to think that it might be um, an independent label that Virgin was, was distributing that didn't last long. Apparently all the tracks... Uh, were written by um, the two musicians involved and um, I didn't play it a lot I was I think I had bought another CD that I, I can't find right now I can't recall who it's by but it's a, a solo synthesizer you know electric keyboard thing and I thought maybe this was another one like that and I bought it and it's uh, it, essentially two nylon string guitars I'm not hearing um, not really hearing uh, offhand. I don't. I'm pretty sure I didn't hear any um, regular steel string acoustic guitars on there. And it starts off with um, something I really don't like when guitarists get together, especially acoustic guitars. And that's a lot of fast strumming. A lot. A lot of songs of faster tempos where they strum, and you know, one guitar they either strum together, and then one guitarist takes a solo while the other one strums frantically, and the the solo is just the guy trying to play as fast as he can, and then the other day they switch off, and the other guitarist starts strumming, and you know the other guy starts taking a solo and playing as fast as they can, and I, I generally don't like those. Um, that's why I, I never actually liked um, the John McLaughlin, Al Di Miola, Paco Di Lucia thing, um, Friday Night in San Francisco. I never dug that because it always struck me as just you know they're playing acoustic guitars, which is nice to hear these guys that normally are electric guitars playing acoustic. But, um, you know, it's like you can barely tell one track from the other where, you know, everything is, you know, strum, strum fast and just everybody's trying to out, out speed each other and everything is just fast, but it doesn't sound like anything. I am not a fan of that stuff. And I think all of those guys are better on their own. Um, you know, uh, and they've all, you know, they're all probably guilty of doing that on their solo projects as well, especially Demiola. Um, and who only lives a few towns away from me, so I really shouldn't be saying that. Um, and McLaughlin has done that too. But I think, you know, you'll see it not as much, but he didn't play electric. Um, but, the, but those guys, I kind of prefer them all on their own. You know, I, I thought they did more wide ranging, more interesting stuff on their own. When they got together, it was like a speed fest, you know. And that's kind of how this album starts, just with two guys playing nylon strings. And um, I really didn't like it at first, and I wasn't even going to review it. I listened to the whole album, and I, I did what I pretty much always do. Unless songs segue together um, on an album, and you know it's basically one long piece that are connected, I pretty much always, when I listen back to an album, I play all the tracks, but I change the order of them, putting the tracks I like first. Uh, on the couple ballads that they do, and one mid-tempo song, I liked it a lot more. And those were deeper in the album. Let's see, deeper in there's only seven tracks, and it only runs 40 minutes. Um, when I when I rearranged it, I listened to it a second and third time, and I liked the album a lot more. There's ballad tracks um, that are nicer. They're more melodic. There's more of a mood and atmosphere to them. Unfortunately, they're like the shortest tracks on the album. And there's also what sounds like a synthesizer player also in two tracks. What it is, though, is um, early, early guitar synthesizer. And how do I know that? Well, I know what the guitar synthesizers that had limited sound samples back then sounded like. And um, there's an Al Daniel album in particular where he plays one from about the same time period. And it's the exact same sound. Uh, but also there's, even though they don't credit the musicians, there's no guest musicians on here, they don't credit the specifics of what's played. Um, they give a thank you to the manufacturers of the guitar to MIDI converter, which means basically somebody does add over the top, overdubbed, 
um, on top of the two nylon string guitars, there's a few moments in there uh, on two songs where the guitar synthesizer comes in. And it's nice because it's texturally, it sounds electronic. And it obviously, with all that acoustic bedding there of the nylon string guitars, it gives a really nice um, variety to the piece, you know, because pretty much everything else you're hearing is just two nylon string guitars endlessly. Um, so when I rearranged it and I put the ballad tracks on top to start off with, and I put the two tracks, even though they're a little bit on the on the faster side, but they're not the speed speeds really fast things. Um, I put those, you know, that that had the the guitar synthesizer on there, which gives it a nice, you know, it varies the sound and keeps the album from sounding samey through the entire thing. And then I put those fast tracks that I don't like really at the end. I ended up liking the album a lot more. You know, I'm definitely definitely going to be listening to it again probably this week after not hearing it for. 10 years, 15, maybe 20 years. It could be even longer than that. Um, and these guys made a bunch of... Uh, I just looked them up. I didn't know anything about them. I looked them up on uh, Discogs, and I see that they made a bunch of solo albums. Uh, going back, even starting before this one from 87, they made some du duo albums, um, or albums together, because I think there might be a rhythm section on some of them. Um, going back even earlier than this, which never even came out on CD. They were just LP things. And they did a couple since then. I think in this country, they're kind of out of print and hard to get. I, I, I think this might be the only thing that ever actually made it over to America that wasn't an import of theirs. But it was interesting to hear again. I'll definitely be listening to it this week. Um, and these are pretty obscure musicians. And I have, I have some more here, but I'm not, I, I, you know, I'm going to... Uh, I have plenty of time for more of these videos. Um... So I thought I would just um, do what I call one-offs uh, for the most part. And uh, it's something to revisit from, from time to time when I'm not, uh, you know, doing expansive historical artists information and, you know, featured artists kind of thing. Uh, so that's all. I'm, you know, already went longer than I intended to. So um, I'll stop it here at about 3.30 in the morning. And I uh, hope everybody's doing well whenever they see this, and hope you guys have a great week. Take care.